Okay. Uh, good Shabbos, everybody. Shabbos. I want to start off by reminding you of one mitzvah that we find in the Torah. There's a mitzvah in the Torah that you're not allowed to carry on the Sabbath, which of course explains my bad singing that I sing here every week because I don't like to carry a tune on the Shabbat. So I have a halachic excuse for why I don't sing so well on a Shabbat. Now, um, you know, uh, I'm very self-conscious and stressed about the sound of my voice and the fact that I don't really sing well and I've got to stand here and lead a service for you guys every week. And some of you guys actually know what notes are and what is, what is false and what isn't false. Um, your problem, not mine. <laughs> what a curse to live with, <laughs> to be able to know when someone's singing false. Uh, that's your problem. Now, I was thinking about my voice one day. I remember even I asked, uh, I asked Justin back there one day, I was like, well, what on earth is my voice? Where do I fall in? Am I tenor, baritone, whatever, all these things? And I couldn't figure out. So I started thinking to myself, what kind of genre does my voice fit into? And Rebecca reminded me there's a very interesting type of singing coming out of Sweden. It's called kulning. That thing. That's exactly what I said. <laughs> kulning. <laughs> Anyway, kulning, it's kind of like yodeling, uh, but it's uh, the Swedish version, and they use it uh, on Swedish farms to call in their cows from the pasture. So in the afternoon, when it's time to call the cows in, they go out there, and they do this seriously high-pitched. It's, it's awesome. No, none of us can do it. Rebecca told me about it, and I found it on YouTube, and you must go watch it. Type in the word kulning, or kulning, and uh, you can watch some video, beautiful videos of some ladies that are calling the cows from the farm. But it's really high-pitched. They go like, eh! Pretty good, eh? If you listen closely, you can hear the cows coming from the farm down the road. Is that When the food's ready. <laughs> and then when they do that, you just hear the bells of the cows. They all come in, coming home, because they recognize this weird and fancy call. So I thought, maybe my voice is similar to the cows that come back into the field. <laughs> I sound more like the cows than the ladies that call the cows. All right, now, uh, so you sing that thing and eventually the cows come home. Now, in this week's parasha, we actually find one of the songs that we sing till this very day in our service here in the shul. As we open the ark, we start off by saying, And we sing that song, right? And then we, go, we all together go, See, Even Morty starts singing now. So that song that we sing over there, that uh, little part that we chant, is a quote from this week's parasha. And we always say it when we open the ark. And the very next verse in this week's parasha, we quote that part every time we close the ark, when we return the Torah to the ark. Then we say, when the ark came to rest, Moses would say, return the Lord to the myriad thousands of Israel. Now the Talmud says, the guys that were responsible for carrying the ark itself, the original ark, the temple ark, Remember last week, Stephen was telling us there are those three families from the, the Cohen, uh, three uh, Levite families. Uh, one of them is called the Kohathites. The Kohathites are the ones who were in charge of carrying the ark itself on their shoulders. The Talmud tells us whenever they picked up and started walking with the ark, they would sing. And what would they sing? This specific prayer that we still do till this very day. And some opinions say they sang the entire time as they were walking with the ark on their shoulders. So that's why today we do the same thing in the shul. Every time we open the ark, we remind ourselves of that by singing that exact same tune that they sang when the ark would travel. Now let me read to you guys a little bit here about uh, the source text that we have for where this comes from. It's from the tra uh, Talmud tract at Arachin 11a, and it says the following. All right, so where do we derive it from that the Levites had to sing every time the Torah traveled and the ark was carried? So Atana derives it from this verse. It says in, let me show you what the verse is, Numbers chapter 7, verse 9. To the sons of Kehat, he did not give any wagons. So remember, we, were, they were, we donated a bunch of wagons and oxes to the temple, and it was given to these families. There were three families, right? The Meraris, and the Gershonis, I think, and the Kehathites. Those other two, they got all the wagons and the oxes. The Kehathites didn't get none. Why? Because they had to carry it on their shoulders. Right? The rest of the tabernacle could be carried on these wagons, but the ark itself had to be carried on their shoulders. So it says, To the sons of Keath, they did not give any wagons. Since the sacred service was upon them, they carried it on their shoulder. When Hebrew would be on the shoulder, they carried it. Now, from the implication of this text, of this verse, it is stated, On the shoulder... Why then does the Torah add a superfluous word by saying they carried it? 
Of course they're going to carry it if it's on their shoulders. So this rabbi is asking the question, why does the Torah add the extra word? The word that says they carried it. We know they carried it. It's on their shoulders. He points out here. So the word Yosu is to carry it. It says here, they carried, Yosu is interpreted here only as an expression of song that they were singing. And so it says in Psalm 81 verse 3, you shall say, ooh, carry up a song and the sound of the drum, the sweet harp with the lyre. And it also says in Isaiah 24 verse 14, Yes, ooh, you will carry up their voice and they will sing. So what is the Talmud telling us here? They carried a tune every time they transported the Ark of the Covenant with the Torah inside. Now, what tune did they carry? Of course, we know it is these two verses from this week's parasha. But something special occurs with the two verses in this week's parasha. I just showed it to you guys all in the scroll. As we lifted up the scroll, those two verses are bracketed by these strange little backwards or upside down letter nuns. They stand out and it like really sets apart those two verses from the rest of the Torah. And it's a really weird thing to think about it that in the Torah, we've got the perfect Torah where every letter is in the right place, right? We've got this section that's bracketed and set apart from the rest of the Torah. You can see that even if you guys have got a Chumash at home, you can see it in your Chumash. It's even printed like that in the Chumash. So what is up with these two random brackets, these two random nuns, these inverted nuns that are in the Torah? So there's a few opinions from our sages. Let me take you through at least two of them. Let me start first with one from Rabbi Yehuda Anasi, Tractate Shabbos 115b. Okay, it says here, the rabbi is taught in a tradition. When the ark would journey and Moses would say, uh, This section, the Holy One, blessed is He, made signs above it and signs below it. He placed markings immediately preceding it and following the section to enclose it and separate it from the rest of the Torah to teach us that this is not the proper place for those two verses. Rebbe says, it is, not, uh, it is not for this reason that the signs appear, though. His opinion is, rather the signs appear because this section ranks as an entire book of the Torah unto itself. The Gemara comments, saying, With whom does the following statement made by Rabbi Shemuel Bar Nachmanid in the name of Rabbi Yonah San agree? Scripture states, this is a quote from Proverbs chapter 9, verse 1. It says, Wisdom has built her house. Now, wisdom in the book of Proverbs always refers to the Torah. So the Torah has built her house. She has hewn it. She has hewn out of her seven pillars. Which means the Torah stands upon seven pillars. It says here, these represent the seven books of the Torah. How many books are there in the Torah? Five. If this section is a book unto itself, it splits the book of Numbers into two which actually makes it seven books of Torah. This rabbi, who is, by the way, Rabbi Yehuda Anasi, is the one who is the compiler of the Mishnah, very important rabbi, he says we have seven books of Torah. So if you go to his Pesach Seder and he says, who knows five? You've got to watch your mouth. You've got to think up something else because he says seven are the books of the Torah. Uh, in accordance with whom this was the statement made? In accordance with Rebbe, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. So that's what he says. It's an entire book unto itself. Which makes it a really, really short book. Two verses long. How do you count that as an entire book? It's quite interesting. That section of Tractate Shabbos in the Talmud is actually discussing how do we count what constitutes a Torah scroll. For example, God forbid a fire was to break out in the synagogue and a Torah scroll was to be burned. How do you know if there's any remnants of the Torah scroll left? At what point do we call it still a Torah scroll? How many letters must still be left for it to be considered a Torah scroll? Or how many letters less than that do we need in order to say, okay, now it's just a burnt piece of paper, we can throw it away. And the Talmud comes and decides, there has to be at least 85 letters left in order for it to be considered a Torah scroll. Why? Because this section between the two nuns is exactly 85 letters long. It constitutes a book of the Torah. So we actually derive halakha from the tradition about the fact that this is considered as an extra book in the Torah. Okay, now I was reading a commentary from a famous rabbi, Abra uh, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. Heard of him before? 
very famous, very famous uh, Jewish philosopher from the previous generation. He's not that long ago. He's from the previous generation. He wrote many beautiful books. He's got a wonderful book on the Shabbat that I would encourage you guys to read. Where he comes and comments on this week's parasha by quoting the Midrash Mishlei, Midrash and Proverbs, that discusses these noons that we find in this week's parasha. This is what the Midrash says. It says, The entire Torah is dedicated to the prophecy of Moshe Rabbeinu. Everything in the Torah is dedicated to the words of Moshe, except for these two verses. These two verses, according to the Midrash, come from the prophecy of Eldad and Midad. You guys know who they are? So they appear in this parasha as well, Eldad and Midad. Uh, Let me read to you here from Numbers chapter 11, verse 24 to 29, to tell you what happened with these guys. 24 to 29. New prophets, here we go. Moshe left and spoke the words of Hashem to the people of Israel, and he gathered 70 men from among the elders of the people and had them stand around the tent. So he was told to gather a few men from each tribe. The problem is, how many tribes are we? 12. So eventually we're supposed to get 72 men. So he gathered these 70 and uh, it says, yeah, Hashem descended in a cloud and spoke to Moshe. And he increased some of the spirit that was upon Moshe. And he took that spirit and gave it to the 70 men, the elders of Israel. When the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but did not do so again. Sounds very much like Shavuot, eh? Two men remained behind in the camp. The name of the one was Aldad, and the name of the second one was Midad. And the spirit rested upon them. They had been among the recorded ones, but they had not gone out to the tent. And they prophesied outside in the camp. The youth ran and told Moshe, and this is old Joshua. Joshua ran and told Moshe. Uh, uh, someone, will, someone told Joshua and Joshua told Moshe and said, Eldad and Midad are prophesying in the camp. So Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of Moshe, the son of Nun, what an interesting name since we're studying the upside down Nuns. No? Um, he, he, the servant of Moshe, since his youth, spoke up and said to Moshe, My Lord Moshe! incarcerate them, arrest them for their prophesying outside there. And Moshe said to him, are you being zealous for my sake? Do you want me to be more important than anyone else? Would that, I would wish that the entire people of Hashem could all be prophets. If Hashem would just place his spirit upon all of them. So these two dudes, Eldad and Medad, these two dads, they were outside of the tent of meeting and they were prophesying out there. And this is one of the things that they prophesied according to the Midrash. They said these two verses. And where did they get these two verses from? Directly from the Holy Spirit. From the Spirit of Hashem. This was the world's first Spirit-led song. Have you ever heard someone claim that their song is Spirit-led? The Holy Spirit gave me this song. What would a Spirit-led song sound like? Growing up for me it was a soaking session. Oh, oh, here we are. You know, play this music, put the smoke machines on and make you drift off into a trance. That was what I was taught as a child, is a spirit-led song. But listen to this. What does a spirit-led song actually sound like? And what do we learn about it? You'll notice, when did we sing this song? Every time the ark traveled with the Torah inside it. Every time we walked and had to take the word of Hashem with us, then we would sing this spirit-led song. Because what is the job of the Holy Spirit? We spoke about this on Shavuot once again. The Holy Spirit says... Ezekiel and Jeremiah say, I will put my spirit inside you and it will cause you to walk, as we travel with the ark, in my ways, in my laws and in my precepts, in the Torah. Now the Midrash continues, by the way, so that is what a spirit-led song is supposed to be like. It's supposed to lead us to walk in the ways of Hashem, of the Torah. The Midrash continues by saying, there is more to this separate book that Eldad and Medad had written. It's not just these two verses that constitute the separate book of the Torah, but there's more that has been lost over the days. It says that it was suppressed. Now, this Rabbi Eshel, he posits that we actually find a fragment of that song. There's a longer version of the song. We find a fragment of it quoted in the Talmud and in the Midrash Rabbah as a song that's recited when the ark traveled. Listen to this. I'm going to read to you guys from Tractate Avoda Zara, page 24b. Now, it's discussing the story of when the Philistines caught our ark. Remember they had the ark for a while? And then all of a sudden horrible things were happening to them. And they said, oh, we better get rid of this ark and send it back to the Jews. 
Their god, Dagon, I think was his name, that fish god thing, fell over and smashed into pieces. And someone asked us, where are our gods? And they said, they're gone. So the gods were gone. And they decided to put the ark on this wagon and with these cows. And then the cows went by themselves all the way to Beit Shemesh. There was no one showing them where to go. They put the ark on this wagon and there the cows went, sending the ark back. So, some? Oh. <laughs> All right, <laughs> let me read to you uh, the discussion of this. So they quote that verse from the book of Samuel. Uh, it says, The cow set out on the direct path, using the Hebrew word, Vayisharna, on the direct path on the road to Beit Shemesh. What is meant by this Hebrew word, Vayisharna? Because it's actually, it's confusing when it talks about the cows being female and using a male term here. So there are two interpretations that are cited. Rav Yochanan said in the name of Rabbi Meir, Vayisharna. Anyone figure out what that word means? Yashar. Have you ever heard the word Yashar? We literally said it a minute ago to Nati after he read. We said Yashar Koach. So Yashar means may you be straightened. And Koach means strength. So may your strength be straightened is what we say. So we say, but we shorten it and we say Shekoyach. is a much shorter version. Right? So Yashar means to be straightened. But this rabbi was confused because it's a different and it's a funny version of the word that's used here. Rav Yochanan said in the name of Rabbi Meir. It means that the cows recited a song unto God. The cows were singing, guys. Why? What's the word for a song in Hebrew? Shir. So he's saying it's not Yashar as in straighten. It's Shir. They were singing a song unto Hashem. But Rav Zutra Bartovia said in the name of Rav, it means that the cows turned their faces towards, directly towards the ark, Yashar, and then recited a song unto Hashem. And the cows started singing. And what song did they recite? Anybody heard a cow sing before? My opinion is Rommimu. Rommimu. That would be a perfect one. All right, so there's a bunch of rabbis with their opinions as to what song these cows recited. Rabbi Yochanan said in the name of Rabbi Meir that they sang the song of Az Yashir, the song of Moses when we crossed the sea. That's Rav uh, Meir's opinion. Rav Yochanan said in his own opinion, the cows sang the song, give thanks to Hashem and declare his name. That is from Isaiah chapter 12 verse 4. Rav Shimon ben Lakish said, the cows sang the orphan psalm. Have you ever heard of the psalm called the orphan psalm? So every psalm in the Bible has got a title or an owner who wrote it. So it'll say like a psalm of David, Mizmor Le David, or a psalm of the songs of Asaf, etc., etc. Or other psalms have at least got a name like the song for the Sabbath. Or a song of thanksgiving. There's one psalm in the Bible that has absolutely nothing. It's Psalm 98. It just starts off by saying a psalm. That's called the orphan psalm. So this rabbi says they sang the orphan psalm. Which says uh, a psalm. Sing to Hashem a new song. For he has done wondrous deeds. His own right hand and holy arm have helped him. So that's that rabbi's opinion. Rabbi Eliezer said the cows sang the psalm that begins with Hashem has reigned. Let your people's Tremble. Hashem Melech. That is from Psalm 99, verse 1. Yet another opinion. Rabbi Shemuel Bar Nachmani said, The cows sang the psalm that begins, Hashem has reigned, he has donned in grandeur, which is Psalm 93. And then comes along the final opinion. According to the final opinion, the cows did not sing a passage from Scripture. So it wasn't one of the psalms. But they sang a special song in honor of the ark. What did they sing? Rav Yitzchak Nafka said, they sang the following song. Sing, sing, O Acacia Wood, exalted in your profound beauty. You who are girded with golden trappings, who are glorified through the book of the palace and are adorned with a crown of crowns. So that's a song written specifically about the ark. Calls it O Acacia Wood because, of course, Acacia Wood was used to build the ark, girded in golden trappings. Why? Because the Ark of the Covenant was... Had two boxes of gold, right? The inside was overlaid with gold as well as the outside with gold. It says, you are glorified through the book of the palace or the book of the sanctuary. It talks about the Torah and the Ten Commandments that were kept inside of the ark itself and are adorned with a crown of crowns. What did we learn from Perkei Avot? What is the greatest crown that all of us can achieve? Not all of us can achieve the crown of priesthood because you have to be an actual descendant of Aaron. Not all of us can crown the crown of kingship because you have to be an actual descendant of David. But there's one crown that all of us can, can acquire, the crown of Torah, which was held in the ark. So apparently this is the song. According to this rabbi, that the cows were singing, not Romemu, but this song. 
Where did they get this song from? This Rabbi Heschel suggests to us he got it from this book of Eldad and Medad. He learned it from there. Uh, Rabbi Eshel actually says, the writer or that rabbi from the Talmud, or even the Midrash, where this exact same story is quoted that the cows were singing this song, the Midrash, the writer of that Midrash, must have had in his day a copy of the prophecy of Eldad and Midad in his hand to hear this cow song that was sung. To me, in my opinion, any song where you add more cowbell, 10 points more. It's a million times better. So, when, so what he says is, whenever we would travel... Moshe would start off by saying, Vayhiben soyoron. And then the Kohathites would say, Vayoimer Moshe, Kumor of two, etc., etc. And then all of Israel would recite this song that we just read to you, the song that was written by Aldad and Medad. A song inspired by the Holy Spirit, so much so that even a cow could sing it. So there's hope for people like me. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's go back to the noons. Why on earth do we have these backwards, upwards, downwards noons in our Torah? So let me continue reading for you from Tractate Shabbos. I read to you earlier uh, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi's opinion. Here's a different opinion. Still on the same section. Tractate Shabbos, page 116a. All right, it says here, The Gemara seeks to identify the Tanakama of this tradition. Who is the Tana that disagrees with Rebbe? It is Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel. For it was taught in a tradition. Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel says... This section of this week's parasha, those two verses, is destined to be uprooted from here, from this section in Numbers, and written... Uh, sorry, let me get back to the way am I now? Uh, this section is destined to be uprooted from here and be written in its proper place. So why was it written over here in the wrong place? In order to separate between the narrative that we're reading. There's a problem with the narrative. Because just before we read these two verses, we've got the narrative of two punishments. The first punishment and the narrative of the second punishment. The Gemara elucidates this tradition. What is the narrative of the second punishment? The Torah tells us the people took to complaining. So the reason why we have this section in the two noons over here is to separate between two of our sins. Actually three of our sins according to some traditions. So it doesn't sound so bad. So we don't sound like such a sinful people. The first section, or actually the, law, the afterwards section, is where we were complaining. What were we complaining about? One rabbi says we were complaining about the manna, and that's when God sent us the quail till it came out of our noses. Another rabbi points out, no, it wasn't that. It was the Levites that were complaining about who they're allowed to marry. Not just specifically who they're allowed to marry, but specifically the fact that they weren't allowed to marry their own family members, their cousins. Now, I've heard of a nun, you know, the Catholic nuns, complaining about not getting married. But I've never heard of a Catholic nun complaining about not being able to marry her cousin. That's a backward nun. <laughs> now, that's what they say here. So that's the one thing that we complained about. So it's, it's hard to read that about the Jews. We don't want to read that about ourselves. So what do we do? Hashem told us, take this section and put it there to separate between that. And what is the first complaint that we did? The narrative of the first punishment is where it says, we traveled from the mountain of Hashem, a travel, a, a journey of three days. Now, regarding this verse, what's wrong with traveling? God told us to travel, right? Rav Chama, the son of Rav Chanina, commented, saying, within three days of their setting out from Mount Sinai, they turned away from Hashem. We moaned again. But the thing is, the, the problem here, it's in the commentaries here, the, that they find with this, is the way that we left Mount Sinai. Uh, Rashi tells us um, that we left Mount Sinai like a kid, running out of school on the last day of school. That's how we left Mount Sinai, which is not the proper way. Mount Sinai is where we received the Torah. We should have left, left it slowly. You know, it's the same when you travel to shul as well. In the mornings, when you travel to shul, you're supposed to walk fast. So if you've been to Israel and Jerusalem, you'll see how fast those guys walk. Their pirates are like, like you know, <laughs> waving in the wind the, way, the speed that they're walking to shul. But on the way back from shul, they're very careful to walk slower. It's the same with Mount Sinai. We should have done the same. But instead... We ran out of there like a child running out of school. I remember a few years back when I was in Sweden, we went there to, um, to celebrate um, Becca's little brother, Jojo, when he graduated from uh, matric. In, in Sweden, they make a big deal of it. All the parents and grandparents gather outside the school's main doors, and they have a big ceremony. They put up these massive speakers, and then one of the teachers slams open the doors, and all the kids that have graduated 
run out full speed and celebrating, throwing things in the air. And they got the speakers blaring out that song, school's out for the summer, school's out forever. And the kids run out there, Woo, it's a big thing, you've got to throw them with roses. And they've celebrated, they've now done with this horrible school. That's how we left Mount Sinai. So we have a problem here. The Torah tells us about these two horrible things we did in a row. So the Midrash says, that's why this section is taken out of place and put in here to separate between those two sinful things, to make us not look so bad every time we read this parasha. Rav Chama, the son of Rav Chanina, commented, saying, within the, uh, they turned away from a god. Uh, and where is this section's actual proper place? So where was this two verses taken from? If it's in the wrong place, Rav Ashi said, with the topic of the banners in Numbers chapter 2. Remember in the beginning of Numbers chapter 2, Prashat Bamidbar, we were reading about all the different encampments of Israel and the flags that each of them had to have and how we were supposed to travel. It was meant to be in that specific place telling us how we are supposed to travel because it talks about when the ox set up, Moses would say, advance. So that's where it's supposed to be, in Numbers chapter 2. Now, it's pretty cool. There's a commentary at the bottom of the Talmud from a rabbi by the name of Rabbeinu Bachya. He asks the question, why specifically did Hashem choose us make us choose the letter Nun to separate this section, to show us it doesn't belong here. Yeah? Because who knows what the number of the letter Nun represents? In Hebrew, we don't use numbers, we use letters that represent numbers. Aleph is one, Beit is two. Nun is 50. And Rabbi Rabbeinu Bachia tells us, if you go to this week's parasha, where we have this extra section, and you count back exactly 50 paragraphs in the Torah, you get to the exact spot where this section is meant to be in Numbers chapter 2. He says that's why we use a noon. Because it tells us 50 chapters back is where it belongs. And when, I, when he says chapters, he means um, paragraphs in a Torah scroll. 50, exactly 50 paragraphs back is where the section actually belongs. Okay, now, that's not where the only place we find noons. We find noons somewhere else in the Bible. And I'm going to suggest to you, this is what I think, this is the psalm I think that this, the cows actually sang. Khar told me about this a few weeks ago. He came here one day and said, Sydney, did you know in Psalm chapter 107, there are seven upside down backwards noons? And I said, no, I did not know that. So check this out. So Psalm 107, uh, you probably won't be able to see it in this small writing, but um, yeah, you guys won't see it. Let me do it here on the camera so you guys can see when you get home. There are seven reversed noons written in Psalm 107. And it was already written in there, in the Talmud talks about this. So back in the days of Yeshua, they already knew that there were these seven noons in Psalm 107. So let me read to you guys a note that the Talmud says about Psalm 107 and why there are seven backward noons. So all in all in the Bible, we've got nine backward noons. So the Talmud in tractate Rosh Hashanah 17 says, uh, it notes the strange punctuation sign which precedes the verse and appears seven times in the psalm. It is called a noon Hafohu. Ever heard that word, hafohu? On Purim, we say, vena hafohu. Everything was turned upside down. Right? You meant it for evil, God meant it for good. Amman tried to kill us by hanging us on the gallows. He himself and his sons ended up hanging on the gallows. That's the whole thing of Purim. Purim, everything was turned upside down. Vena hafohu. So these are called the nun hafohu, the reversed nuns or the backward nuns. And it is a sign of exclusion or diminution, meaning... Is the teaching of why we have these seven noons. And you can go read Psalm 107 this afternoon when you get home. It talks about the guys that repent and turn to God and cry out to Hashem and these uh, sea wayfarers that are crying out to Hashem, asking Him to save them. It means that not all who cry out when they are in peril will be answered by Hashem. Some will be excluded. Because once the heavenly decree is issued and sealed, the decree will not be changed. Only the man who cries out to Hashem before the decree is sealed will be delivered. That is the lesson from these backward moons. That you can be secluded, left out, diminished, if you don't repent in time. Does that message sound familiar? That, my friends, is the entire gospel summed up by Yeshua. That is Yeshua's teaching, which is, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And both Rabbeinu Bachya and Rashi comment on this very section of the Talmud that's talking about the noons in this week's parasha. They say, the section from the parasha, which is in its wrong place, will be returned one day to its correct place when the Mashiach comes. Why? 
Because when the Mashiach comes, they say, then the evil inclination will become obsolete in the presence of the divine. Meaning that those two punishments we read in this week's parasha that we want to split, those sinful acts of the Israelites will no longer tarnish Israel. Why? Because when the Mashiach comes, our sins will be washed away. There's a prerequisite for your sins to be washed away. What is that? Teshuvah. To turn and to repent. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Similarly, a commentator or a commentary known as the Sif Sechachamim, which is a commentary on Rashi, very famous one, it states the following, listen to this, it says, the noons are inverted backwards specifically to teach us that we need to turn backwards as well. Turn back through Teshuva. This is what he says. To turn ourselves around through tears and heartfelt prayer that will overturn any danger that is facing us before it is too late. So what we have here, the purpose of this misplaced section in our Torah between these two sins is to teach us that when we walk on the wrong path, it happens to us, sometimes we get led down the wrong path into a sinful way. You have to remember this tune of the Vayahib and Sawyer and Vayom Moshe. Remember this tune. Get up and walk. Because what is this tune about? It's a traveling of the ark with the Torah inside. It's to remind us that we have to get up, turn around, and walk the other way. Those noons are pointing towards where they belong. And just like this section from this parasha is in the wrong section, and it's to return to Numbers chapter 2, so too we need to return to where we belong. We need to hear this tune in the back of our heads. And how do we do that? How do we get there? Rashi and Rabbeinu Bachia, the Talmud are telling us, with the help of Mashiach and the help of the Holy Spirit. So we're supposed to be hearing the song if next time you guys are in a dark alley where you're not supposed to be. In the back of your mind, Hashem, the Holy Spirit, might send you this tune. By Heaven, so by Yomer, Moshe. And what does Yeshua say? My sheep hear my voice. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, we find the main message of Yeshua. The main teaching of the Gospels. Hidden for us in the Torah. This time, hidden in the very structure of the Torah itself. And what is that message? Repent, repent, repent until the cows come home. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom.